Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar. We're going to give a couple of minutes just for more people to log on. So we'll go ahead and start our presentation in about a minute, just as we have more people log on. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction, and then we'll begin tonight's webinar. Alrighty. Well, uh, hello, everybody, and, and thank you for joining uh, our webinar tonight. My name is Michael York, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please do feel free to go ahead and enter them into the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your browser. Uh, we'll be sure to address those at the end of tonight's program. Uh, our webinar this evening is uh, the latest approaches to eye infections, and it will be brought to you uh, by the wonderful Dr. Benaz Rouhani. Um, Dr. Rouhani received her medical degree with high honors from Shahid Beheshti University of Medical Sciences uh, and conducted her ophthalmology fellowship at the Rocky Mountains Lions Eye Institute uh, at the University of Colorado. Uh, after that, Dr. Rahani then grant, uh, was granted her residency at Drexler University and selected chief resident in her final year. Uh, after which, after her residency, Dr. Rahani completed a fellowship in cornea and refractive surgery at the Ross Eye Institute, uh, the State University of New York. Um, so with a little bit of her background taken care of and without any further ado, uh, I'll pass over tonight's program to Dr. Rahani. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, so we just wanted to take our time and uh, talk about some common things that we basically come uh, along with on a daily basis um, with a lot of uh, patients. So I thought uh, to talk to you about uh, those things and also go over the latest approaches that we have uh, been basically taking into account for eye infections that we're dealing with and we're seeing pretty commonly these days. So the, just to start with uh, a little talk about what we're just gonna talk about tonight and what are the important things. I get a lot of patients that they call me or they come into the office and they're very concerned about just having a little bit of an irritation or red eye, feeling that they could be contagious to the others and if the red eye is always an infection. So we're gonna talk about whether what are the eye infections and what could cause the eye infections what is the red eye and what are the most common causes of red eyes and if every red eye is an infection and uh, when to seek attention and when to call your doctors and go and see them and uh, last but not least what are the latest exciting approaches to the eye infections so just a little bit about a human eye because I'm going to show you quite a few pictures and I want you to know about the eye a little bit um, and um, the areas that could be affected by just having a red irritated eye. So this is just a very simple picture of a human eye. You can see the eyelid. You can see the white part of the eye, which is sclera. On top of the sclera, there is a very clear tissue, which is called conjunctiva. In front of the color part of the eye, I'll show you in the next picture, there is a clear tissue, which is cornea, and the color part is iris. And at the center of the um, iris, it's the pupil. If you look at the eye from the side, this is kind of like a cut um, way of the picture of the eye that you can see. These are the eyelids. This is the clear cornea tissue that we see. You see, there is a white part, which is sclera. On top of sclera, there is a clear tissue that extends onto the inside of the lids also, and the eyeball, and that's conjunctiva. And when we see a lot of irritations and 
um, infections and inflammation, uh, basically. The rest of the eye, I'm not going to get into it because that's not the topic of our talk today. And this is another picture just to show you a little bit better. This is the clear cornea and color part of the eye or iris. This is the white part, which is sclera. And on top of sclera, you can see the clear tissue, which is conjunctiva, which extends not only on the eyeball, but also it goes all over into the side of your eyelids on top and on the bottom. Okay, this is most of you, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. This is just a red pink eye that patients, when they have it, they're very scared of po possible infection or any important thing going on. And they would come to the office or they wanna see whether they should do anything about it and whether antibiotics would help. A lot of patients with this eyes, they would go to urgent care or primary care physician and they're given antibiotic drops. And then a lot of times they say, okay, we use antibiotic drops, but they didn't help at all. So we're gonna talk about that. Important things to know when you get such a redness or irritated eye. We wanna know, you also wanna know about it, you know, think about it. If there was any history of trauma, are you a contact lens user? Do you take care of your contacts as you're supposed to? Do you sleep in them? Do you swim with them? Do you think that your symptoms have been gradual or sudden onset redness or irritation? Is one eye affected or both of them are? Are you having any pain, itchiness, greatest sensation or foreign body sensation? Any changes in your vision have you noticed or any light sensitivity? which is very important also. Discharge can let us know a lot about these conditions. Also, you wanna know whether there is any associated systemic disorders or conditions such as um, coughing, uh, headache, nausea, any other autoimmune conditions that I didn't put it in this slide, but I always ask my patients if they have any associated symptoms, any associated systemic condition going on, which is very important. I'm gonna let you know in a little bit. Also, we wanna know if there is any family member with any similar symptoms and also any treatment that patients have received, such as going to their doctors, uh, the urgent care or primary care doctors receiving any antibiotics or anything that they have at home and they use. All of those are very important. Most of the common causes of red eye, we're gonna go over. Obviously, you know, um, infections could cause red eye, allergies could. Patients with dry eyes and blepharitis or condition that affects the uh, glands at the base of your lashes on top and bottom lids, um, they can cause irritation and redness. Subconjunctival hemorrhage is when you have a little uh, bruise in your eye. Uh, chemical injuries with acids or alcoholic agents can cause such a thing. Trauma, any trauma, any punch in the eye. Um, sport related traumas, eye surface lesions, which is very important to know too. And patients with glaucoma. Um, and I'm gonna talk very briefly about that um, in a second. And also we wanna know if there is any ongoing systemic infections or any inflammatory conditions, such as what I just um, told you about autoimmune conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, Sjogren's, and also if, a, if you guys have sleep apnea and uh, you were CPAP or not, do you have any floppy or just loose eyelids, and that could cause irritation as well. Classification of red eye, we have some not really vision threatening conditions and some really more important vision threatening ones. So the vision threatening ones that basically we need to be on top of it on time and as soon as possible, there are some cornea infections. Basically, let's put it this way. Whoever is a contact lens user and they figure out that they have some irritation, they should be seen as soon as possible because cornea infections are seen a lot more common in contact lens wearers as compared to the others. Scleritis, iritis, uveitis are all inflammation of the eyeball and they are seen in the presence of autoimmune conditions or no known condition. We can have that, those. Um, anything that causes elevation of your eye pressure or acute angle closure glaucoma, which is an emergency 
We can see that, uh, again, infections around the eye or orbital cellulitis. Chemical injuries are very important to be addressed right away. And infection that is extended into the eye, which uh, is a massive severe infection, endophthalmitis is vision threatening and should be seen and addressed right away. Those that are non-vision threatening should not really scare you much, but that does not mean that you should not be seen. But it's just like something that we can treat, you can talk to us, and then you can be seen just a little bit later, not right as soon as possible. Or subconjunctival hemorrhage or having a little bit of a blood or bruising on the white part of the eye. Uh, the styes or uh, again, blepharitis and dry eyes that are very, very common and sometimes cornea scratches could be just superficial and not really significant to cause any issue. Symptoms can vary, as you all know, itching, scratchiness, deep pain, discharge, and light sensitivity all can help us know what exactly is causing the issue to you. So not every itching is dryness, it could be allergy, but we can see it in a lot of patients with blepharitis, inflammation of the eyelids and uh, glands, and also dryness, scratchiness and burning. Again, we see in uh, conditions such as blepharitis, styes and dry eyes. Deep pain, however, should make us a little bit more worried and uh, uh, should make us uh, look into further things such as inflammatory conditions and uh, also increased eye pressure. Discharge, depending on what kind of a discharge it is, it um, will let us know more about the condition of the eye from watery, yellowish, greenish, really purulent or profuse purulent discharge can help us with diagnosis, the condition and treatment based on what we're dealing with. And light sensitivity is very important too because anything that causes irritation of the eye surface, including conjunctiva and cornea, can cause light sensitivity, also inflammation. So I'm just gonna quickly go over a few things that we already discussed and uh, I know it's not infection that I'm gonna talk about, but there are just a few things that you wanna know more about and uh, you don't wanna let them go. Yeah, like a lot of patients call me and say, okay, it was weekend, I didn't wanna uh, call and I knew office was closed and I waited. So a lot of these conditions, you should not wait. At least you need to call us or contact your optometrists um, that are open over the weekend. Uh, we are also on call over the weekend and all over the week uh, to be able to take care of you. So just out of this presentation, please feel free with any questions or concerns. You always, there is always a provider, a physician, um, basically on call to be able to address and help you. Chemical exposure is when you have some sort of uh, detergent or like chemical exposure to your eye. And that's an ocular emergency or eye emergency. We need to know the alkali are worse than acids and you never wanna kind of like neutralize either of those. You wanna always irrigate with the, just the tap water as much as you can until you get yourself to emergency room or to the office. And um, I just wanted to stress out how important it is to seek medical attention because it can affect cornea specifically and also conjunctiva. It can cause redness too. So this is one of the things that we see red eye, but it's not infection. Dry eye disease, we talked about it. We're not gonna go into it too much because it's pretty common. I'm sure a lot of patients, they already have it. They know about it a lot. So we need to treat that. That's one of the things that can cause mucousy discharge, which is not really um, uh, infection. It's just like a, not a very consistent and good uh, tear film quality. Uh, blepharitis, we already talked about that. Again, it's just inflammation of the glands that are in charge, meibomian glands that are in charge of producing the oily part of the tear film. And we wanna make sure that we take care of those too. That itself can cause irritation and redness and swelling of the eyelids, in addition to redness of the eye, which will concern uh, patients and they would think that this is, again, another sort of infection going on or if they are contagious but it's not, and then we have to address that accordingly. 
And this is, again, a lot of uh, patients who have blepharitis need to take care of those be because that can put, um, put patients and eyes basically at risk of infection. Again, this is what we see with blepharitis. The, these are all little glands at the base or edge of your eyelid, right behind the lash line. You see, they're like looking like toothpaste. They want to get out the oily part of a tear film because tear film does have not only water, it does have oil to it to keep it nice and smooth on the surface of the eye. Otherwise, it's going to evaporate too quickly or you're going to lose it. Um, so sometimes they get irritated or clogged, so you can see that, and then the eyelid becomes thick, irritated, red eye can happen, and this is what we see uh, when there is more um, aggravation to the uh, lash line too, and then there are just like different types of blepharitis that we can have when patients can get dust mite or anything like microbial stuff to basically block the uh, those glands and cause irritation of the eyelids. Or the allomerostyes are again are the uh, infection of the hair follicle or the lash follicle. Usually there are staph, uh, um, uh, basically staphylococcal infections that can cause those, which are normal bacteria that they live on our skin that they can become bad basically. And then we treat them with topical antibiotic drops and uh, lid hygiene and warm compresses basically. You usually don't need to do much about that. Honestly, the best way to treat the, those are warm compress as many times as you can. And more than antibiotic drops, ointments can help. This is what you see, just this is like infection of the hair follicle or lash follicle. And you can see there is like a white head to it and lots of uh, swelling and redness of the eyelid. Uh, Chalazion, however, is different because that it's gonna look like sty, but it's not a sty, it's just inflammation of those glands that I just showed you. And they're gonna be clogged up and all those oily material that were supposed to be part of your tear film will get stuck in there and then it's gonna cause a bump. Of most of the patients, they feel this is sty, but they're usually less painful, but very chronic and hard to go away. Again, warm compress is gonna help with these conditions a lot. Antibiotic ointments can help with the irritation and infection that, can, that patient can get um, after having chalazion basically. And also some steroid ointments can help with calming the inflammation down. Sometimes this can cause pretty extensive eyelid edema and swelling. So you see that this is just like larger area that we see right on top of the lid. It extends much more higher and it can sometimes affect the eyelid and patients sometimes wake up with completely stuck lids together and they get scared that, okay, this is something going on and what should we do? And then we talk to them or we see them. If after a few weeks, this doesn't go away, then we can drain it. All right, so UVI, this is inflammation of the eye. Again, that can cause redness, but it's uh, usually not infectious, mostly uh, inflammatory. However, some infections such as Lyme disease, TB and syphilis can cause that too. So we usually see patients, evaluate them. Again, it can cause pretty bad red eye. So don't think that every red eye is infection. It's very important to see every patient with red eye to make sure there's no uveitis going on. Inflammatory conditions can really damage tissues inside the eyes, just not only on the surface. And we have to look further into other systemic diseases or infections to see what's causing that inflammation in the eye. Um, this is a patient that was sent to me to take care of the dry eye. And because of continuous or chronic redness going on. And I looked at this patient, the patient was very light sensitive. She wouldn't be able to keep the eyes open in the regular room light. And then I looked at the eye and I saw lots of pus in the front part of the eye. This is between the cornea and the color part of the eye, inside the eye. All of this redness is seen here and lots of inflammation inside the eye. So instead of starting patient on antibiotics in this case, I started patient on steroids and she felt much better after. Other autoimmune conditions or inflammatory conditions that can cause redness of the eyes 
are episcleritis or scleritis, which are the inflammation of the, the white part of the eye. But the scleritis has pretty bad, deep pain that can wake up patients from sleep. Again, lots of um, redness can be seen. Those should be seen pretty fast because thinning can go on and melting can happen and we have to treat them on time. So episcleritis usually is just the inflammation and redness the, of the um, clear tissue over the white part of the eye. And that is sectional or just sectorial, one place, usually self-limited. It's gonna go away even without doing anything. Usually irritation is there, not too much of a pain as opposed to scleritis. And you can see these angry looking vessels here and they're really not um, uh, fun to deal with. And patients are very unhappy because of the significant amount of pain. These cases are very important too. Again, sometimes with these eyes, Urgent care and primary care physicians may think this is just infection. They start patients on um, uh, antibiotic drops. And sometimes because of inflammation, they start steroids. In these cases, topical steroids are, should not be used because of thinning risk. So these are one of the rare eye issues that we treat orally rather than topically. And then subconscious hemorrhage, which we see pretty common in the office on a daily basis as an emergency add-on to my schedule basically is because patients wake up and then they feel, oh, one part of the white part of the eye is already just full of blood underneath the tissue and it gets worse because there is a space between conjunctiva and sclera that it can spread. Uh, most of the time it's spontaneous. It's just the burst of those little vessels that we have on the top of um, the clear part of the eye or conjunctiva. Uh, usually there's no change in vision. Patients are just mostly worried about it. And sometimes coughing, sneezing, pressure, such as childbirth, vomiting, um, really hard exercise and strenuous activity. Those who have uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes can have um, that happening pretty often. Blood thinners obviously can put you at risk of having that too. Usually if there's no bleeding inside the eye, they're just self-limited. We we're just we give patients reassurance just uh, for irritation can do some cool compress and artificial tears. It's nothing really to worry about. These are the things sometimes they can be only localized and then they can spread and take away the whole part of the uh, white part of the eye. Okay, so in these cases, it's always good to see you just to make sure there's nothing similar to this inside the eye, which usually it's not there. And specifically, if you start noticing new floaters or brown floaters, you want to definitely come in. Otherwise, they're self-limited. It takes a few weeks to go away. It's like a natural bruise. How many days that it takes, these will take the same. Okay, and then one last but not least before we get to infections, it's just like ocular surface lesions. Like we have surface eye, if you have heard of that. So sunlight, UV and UVB can change the conjunctival tissue and make it a little bit thicker and more vascular and more scarred out. Those are very important, but one thing that we don't wanna miss is malignancies that we can get on the eye surface too. And then again, I was not able to um, add that picture to this slide, um, unfortunately, but I wanted to show you, I, it was uh, during the quarantine time that I was um, called and a patient was sent to me because of ongoing uh, right eye discharge and redness. And he was treated with multiple different antibiotics and also steroids to uh, calm down any inflammation in the eye and patient wouldn't get better. So he came in. So he had telemedicine because of the quarantine time, but he ended up coming in because we used to just have like half a day of a clinic to see all emergency cases that time. And then I saw him and he, I found him having a large tumor on the surface of the eye. So these are very important to make sure that we see them and uh, take care of that. And angle closure glaucoma is when patients will have a lot of pain redness, dilated pupil and huge um, sudden onset decline in their vision and high pressures that we have to treat them as an emergency as well. Again, they get red eye, they have, they will be 
pretty concerned about infections, but again, this is not an infection and we should see that. All right, so a little bit about conjunctivitis or the um, basically pink eye or red eye. We wanna talk about it and talk about the treatments that these days we are um, using to help patients with, specifically in the pandemic time. Um, so conjunctivitis or pink eye can be viral due to viruses, bacteria, chlamydia, or it could be allergy, or as we talked about it, due to chemical exposure. Usually, um, they, um, they can feel just irritated, no pain with it. Um, sometimes with contact lenses, or if a patient has a, a stitch in the eye for any surgery, they can develop what we call giant papillary conjunctivitis, which is just a reaction of the tissue to that foreign object. So we're going to remove that. Or if patient is a contact lens user, we're just going to give them holiday, basically, or time off. We call it holiday. But we give them a time off for a um, little rest of the eye. And so we let the conjunctiva have some time to go back to the normal, less irritated state. If there is so much of pain with conjunctivitis or pink eye, again, we have to look for other things. Light sensitivity is very rare with conjunctivitis or pink eye. So if a patient has a pink eye with light sensitivity, again, we have to look for other things. Other than one case of one uh, virus that it's called adenovirus, and it can cause pretty severe viral infection of uh, the eye and conjunctivitis that could cause uh, light sensitivity. Usually can be uh, one-sided or both-sided and discharge can be there and uh, there could be some eyelid swelling as well. Mostly with viral pink eyes, um, which are very contagious, um, the cause it's a certain virus that we call adenovirus. And there are two different kinds that we're gonna talk about it. Molluscum is another virus that can uh, cause um, red eyes. And these days I have been seeing a lot of herpes simplex virus affecting the uh, eyes and also shingles. COVID-19 also can present with just pink eye, which we'll talk about that as well. So adenovirus has two different, I mean, different types, basically. Two of the most common uh, ones that we see mostly in kids, and that's most of the families get, come to me and say, okay, my kids had it, so I got it. That is usually coming with just some systemic symptoms such as sore throat, runny nose, and fever, uh, but usually it's mild and self-limited and will go over away on its own. And it has some watery discharge. Some patients have it, some patients won't, but it's contagious. So we wanna make sure that we take everything into account in terms of multiple hand washing, which these days I think everyone is doing it anyway. And um, I just wait for the course to be um, gone, which usually takes about 10 days. The bad form of it, which is the epidemic form, can be much more contagious and can affect everyone in the family members. Um, there's usually no systemic symptoms. So no sore throat, no runny nose, no fever, um, but it can involve cornea, which is very important because that means that vision can be affected by it. And sometimes it can be so severe that it can cause bruise on the eye surface and also some bad sticky membranes can be uh, basically uh, develop in uh, these severe cases. So this was another patient that I saw during the pandemic again. Um, uh, this uh, patient called me uh, through telemedicine and I looked at his eye, obviously examination is pretty limited, but then I had him pull his eyelids down and come a little closer from the video and I saw this huge area of yellowishness. And he was just like, well, this is a discharge. I'm like, well, I should see you in the office. So he came to the office and this is what I found. This was not really discharge. That was a complete sticky membrane that was attached to the lower lid and was affecting the whole vision. So it was extending basically. So I had to remove it for him. So I removed it and this is after that. A day after that, he was completely much, much better and vision was uh, recovering as well. So it's very important 
to see these cases, again, with viral conjunctivitis, however, there's no antibiotics that would help. So this case was given antibiotic. Nothing changed with antibiotics. So lubrication and cool compress can help. Um, sometimes we give antibiotics just to prevent uh, super infection with bacteria, but otherwise it needs to take its time to go away. Sometimes it can affect cornea and you see just these little uh, dots on the cornea, which will affect the uh, vision on the cornea um, uh, if there are pretty like dense. Some of them could be like these ones, very faint ones, they're transient, they won't stay too long. And um, usually in these cases, we don't pa start patients on steroids because they can give rebound uh, opacities, basically. In these cases, however, we have to start patients on steroids to minimize the scar tissue. What are these? These are actually when your immune system wants to kill the bacteria and uh, or the virus or any microbial, basically, agent. And then they basically deposit on cornea and they affect the vision when the light exposure is there. Olascom is another virus that we see that in, in kids a lot and also in adults. Uh, you can see like little kind of like waxy nodules on your eyelids and the virus can shed into the eyelid and then cause lots of redness and irritation and pinky eyes basically with some discharge. So there's no antibiotic that can help with this. No artificial tear or lubrication or warm compress or cool compress. The only thing that we should do with these cases is to remove all of these lesions or destruct them uh, because of the shedding of the particles from these lesions. So once they're gone, we don't have any problem with um, basically a continuation of the shedding of the virus and irritation from that. Herpes simplex. Um, I can't stress enough how important this is because it's pretty common here as well, specifically throughout pandemic time because of a lot of stress levels and um, a lot of things that we've been going through everyone in their own way. Uh, it's very stress related too. So herpes simplex is a virus that a lot of people have it, but it sleeps, so it goes dormant. And it just waits for a condition when the stress level goes up and immune system is dropped. And then it wakes up and affects either skin, face, body, or um, the eye. This type will take the eye and face. So like cold sores are associated with this type. So as the eye problems, this is different from sexually transmitted disease uh, associated um, herpes simplex. So usually patients come in again with a lot of red eye irritation, sometimes with high pressures and inflammation in the eye and definitely vision is most of the time affected by it. They look like on exam, like a little tree branches or bulbs basically. Um, you might ask why are, these are green. We actually give a special type of eye drop to our patients. Most of you are very um, uh, familiar with those. They're just the yellowish drops that we give to take pressures. But in these cases, we give it just to use the blue light and see whether these gonna light up and that's gonna help with our diagnosis. All right, so a lot of times with these cases, if the cornea is involved, we have to start patients on oral antivirals. Sometimes we may need to do topical or eye drops that are antivirals, antibiotic drops, Again, it's not gonna be given to treat this condition. It's gonna be given to prevent any um, super infection with bacteria. Herpes zoster is shingles. And that's gonna give sort of a similar way. This is shingles. So it was pretty kind of like similar to that. Um, but there are some differences between the two. Patients usually get like lots of rash over the forehead, which is not gonna cross the midline. Uh, they usually start with the forehead pain or scalp pain, and then the rash break out, and then the eye will get affected. Sometimes the eye is not affected, but patients are sent to us to take a look because we wanna make sure the eye is not involved when there is a close proximity of those lesions to the eyes. 
And uh, believe it or not, if the eyes are of no concern, but patients come to us and they have a little bit of a lesion on the tip of their nose, that is a sign that we should treat that patient as a patient who has the eyes, the eye involved as well, because the nerves, this virus leaves in nerves. So the nerves that innervate the tip of the nose are same that innervate the cornea. So we have to treat you as a patient who has shingles in the eye. So it's very important. Again, one Im more important thing that why we should be seen when we have red irritated eyes. And also what do we do with shingle patients? Um, again, you're gonna be on the same antiviral medications at, as we treat herpes simplex with, but with a different dosage. We also treat any inflammation in the eye and we monitor very closely because all of these can cause um, basically scarring or cornea damage. Denervation means the nerves can get damaged and the cornea sensation can be affected by it. All right, and COVID-19 conjunctivitis. Um, we still, as we all know, we still don't know a lot of things about uh, COVID-19, but we do know that they can present with red eye. Um, so it could be the only manifestation or a patient can get COVID-19 with other um, respiratory symptoms and develop red eyes. Usually uh, all the research that has been done so far have uh, shown that patients manifest with the red eye within the 10 days from becoming positive for the virus. It is contagious, so you can basically give that to another person, not just the conjunctivitis, but a patient can get COVID-19 from a patient who has a pink eye because of COVID-19. So again, that's how important it's to wash hands and just do the social distancing. Irritation and redness can be seen. And uh, if we culture just the conjunctival or the eye, we can see that COVID-19 is positive. Usually it's self-limited, no treatment is needed. Um, but uh, there are studies that have shown that uh, there are some potential benefits from some eye drops, which we don't have really uh, commonly available, which is this ribavirin drop that uh, could be beneficial in certain really significant cases. And again, understanding of the possible further ocular complications of COVID-19 still is limited. Um, we still need a lot of research and lots to know about this. So this is a case that ended up being admitted to the hospital. This person ha was uh, tested positive for COVID-19, then started developing cough, shortness of breath, ended up being admitted to the hospital. And then on day 10, he started having lots of redness, irritation. And then he was um, started on treatment for COVID-19 in the hospital, but nothing for the eyes. And he got a little bit better. But again, you see some sort of inflammation and redness over here. But then after a little while, uh, other than cool compress and lubricating drops, he was started on the antiviral drops. And a few days after, uh, the eyes basically were much better and much more comfortable. All right, so we're done with the viral concept and we're just going to the bacterial conjunctivitis, which is the most common sort of conjunctivitis caused by um, microbes or bacteria. I usually can have whitish yellowish discharge. Treatment is with spectrum antibiotics to help with any sort of bacteria that we could be dealing with. The only one that we need more treatment other than topical antibiotics would be gonococcal or chlamydial um, infections that uh, they would need um, sometimes even IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics to be taken care of. If we don't um, treat gonococcal or comedial conjunctivitis mm, correctly, they can put patients at risk of uh, further cornea involvement, melting, 
perforation and extension of the infection into the eyes. So again, it's very important to be assessed and treated by the, uh, the eye doctors. And um, as I said, sometimes systemic and IV antibiotics are required. So this is a typical case. I'm sure everyone has seen such a thing. And the red eye, a little bit of like a mucus discharge. If it's really bad and whitish, we need to irrigate and start really extensive antibiotics. Allergic conjunctivitis, usually not really infectious, but can cause similar symptoms. So again, those cases won't really get better with antibiotics. So we need to see them. And a lot of times patients know that they have a lot of allergies, so they start taking pills. And in allergies of eyes, those pills usually don't penetrate into the eye, don't get to the eye, and then they don't really help. So in these cases, topical anti-allergy eye drops would be pretty helpful in addition to symptomatic treatment with cool compress and cool artificial tears. Obviously, if we know what's causing it, which is hard at times to avoid what's causing the allergy. Okay, this is my favorite topic because it's cornea, I should say. Um, cornea causes of red eyes. So there are things that can happen to cornea that could cause a lot of redness and um, amazing treatments are now out there to treat these uh, conditions. So we have abrasions and erosions or scratches that can cause irritation and redness of the eye. Trauma, obviously, with any foreign body that can get to the eye while working with metals or any sort of, you know, uh, gardening. Um, these things are the stuff that we can see. Uh, sometimes blunt traumas with punch or the champagne cork can cause a lot of issues. So those are very important because not only we want to look for any scratch or any damage to cornea, we want to make sure everywhere else is also okay because those blunt punch traumas can cause retinal tears or detachment sometimes, or even bone fractions around the eyeball. Corneal ulcer is also very important. Again, I can't stress enough how important it is in contact lens wearers to be checked out uh, if they have any irritation. Uh, herpes infections can affect cornea, as I showed you, and also autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis can cause really irritation of the cornea, ulceration, and thinning. So cornea abrasion, a lot of people have had it. A lot of times we see it's just like a very superficial scratch on the cornea. And again, this is the clear part of the eye or cornea, and we can see like little minor scratches. This can be seen with uh, fingernails, or like a lot of babies do that to their moms. And uh, even rubbing of the eye with tissues can cause such um, uh, scratches. Um, uh, trauma, tree branch, we see it a lot. Um, floppy eyelid, eyelid, I told you in sleep apnea patients because the eyelid is just so floppy and doesn't close very well. And patients sleep on their face on the pillow, they can scratch the cornea. And sometimes abnormally positioned uh, lashes. So lashes usually should be grown outward. And sometimes in certain conditions, the uh, lashes are basically grown inwards and they can cause scratch, basically. Treatment is usually with uh, artificial tears because uh, cornea is an amazing tissue. If it is healthy, it can regenerate itself and it can basically build up the area that is scratched. Um, sometimes because patients can be very uncomfortable, we can put a bandage contact lens. However, we have to be very careful that there's no signs of infection to do so. Um, also, uh, they usually heal without any scarring. And um, if it is traumatic, such as fingernail or tree, branch, then tree branches, um, they could put a patient at risk of recurrent erosions or abrasions. That means once this scratch happens, it makes that area pretty weak um, and it's not going to kind of like uh, attach to the rest of the cornea tissue very well so it's prone to slough off pretty easier so that's cornea erosion you see just a, a little bit of a vague opacity on the cornea where the tissue is not really uh, strong enough to attach to the rest of the layers that can happen. There are some certain uh, uh, conditions that are inherited and can put the patient at risk of having recurrent erosions. 
and or what we just talked about. These usually cause pretty excruciating pain, light sensitivity and blurry vision heals on its own. And sometimes patients need to put some more eye drops or contact lenses to help with healing process. But if, it, if they commonly happen or recurrently happen, then we have to go ahead and treat them with either laser or recently we have started doing a newer thing, which is amniotic membranes. And I'm gonna to talk to you in a little bit. Corneal ulcerations also, again, I talked to you about um, thinning or um, uh, pretty loss of integrity of corneal tissue can happen due to infection or inflammatory conditions. Bacterial infections are the most common. It uh, could be fungal, virus, or parasites too, but mostly bacteria. Most common risk factor is a contact lens wear. Please, if you're a contact lens wear and you feel you're a little bit irritated, take that out right away. Don't wait. Don't put lubricating drops because if you don't remove it, you're gonna let the bacteria or any microbial agents to stay there and grow and do whatever they want. And then patients usually get really to a stage that they can't tolerate anymore the contact lens and they remove it when it's a little bit too late. Thinning can happen, perforation of the cornea and a lot of uh, bad stuff such as, you know, decreased vision or sometimes loss of vision can happen. And sometimes we need to get patients to get the transplant uh, because of either melting or significant amount of scar. Uh, again, prognosis depends on the size, location, how major and how spread out it's the corneal ulcer. So these are different types of cornea ulcers we see. So this is just one thing. You can see that this area is a little bit thinned out and it's stained. So it's just like a pretty deep scratch sort of a thing. This is all pus inside the eye because of infection. This is a little bit of, again, thinning. And these are mostly seen with contact lens users, but this again can happen with trauma and stuff. This feathery looking opacity on the cornea is usually fungal. These are little ones in patients who have rosacea and staphylococcal infections. This is a little bit tree branch and kind of like light bulb stuff that I just talked to. Herpetic ulcers can cause this. And this is in a patient who was a contact lens user, had a bad um, infection with Pseudomonas, which is one of the invasive bacteria associated with contact lens um, wear. And uh, this is when patient didn't really uh, seek attention on time. Sometimes they even when they seek attention on time and we treat them really hard, this can happen still. But again, the sooner the better. Treatment of the infections. So as usual, we always have uh, antibiotics going and uh, topical ointments, topical drop and ointments. Sometimes we may need to go ahead and order uh, specific eye drops that they should be compounded and made specifically for that infection. Uh, topical antiviral drops and gels can be used in herpetic infections and viral infections, topical antifungals for fungal infections, uh, oral antibiotics, antiviral antifungals at times they may be needed. But what we have been seeing is that sometimes we use all of these like antibiotics, antiviral, antifungals we have, but we don't see much that we wanna see. So that's what brought us to look for further things that we can do to take care of these infections. So one of the things that is really, really uh, exciting that's going on is cornea collagen cross-linking, uh, which uh, we have been doing that using with vitamin uh, B2 and uh, ultraviolet light to, for certain conditions such as cone-shaped corneas. But now we have started using that in patients who are at risk of losing the integrity of their cornea because what this procedure does, it helps with the collagen bindings of the cornea tissue. So it will re definitely help with preventing, with, uh, preventing the further melting and perforation of the cornea, which put patients at risk of having transplants in the future. So, a lot more needs to be done to see how much these can help with different types of microbial uh, infections, but it has been shown to be pretty helpful in bacterial and fungal infections. Uh, in addition to the older version of treatments that we have with antibiotics and antivirals, okay? 
uh, and again, effective treatment may limit the need of emergent cornea transplant, which is pretty ex extensive and could be associated with higher rates of infection and rejection in the future anyway. So it's very important to have it handy. And thankfully, we are grateful that we have this um, procedure going on in our practice. Complications could happen with this. Uh, such as redness, inflammation, uh, or just some in, uh, elevation of the amount of uh, pus in the eye. But again, adjunctive treatment will take care of that. Failure to control microbial keratitis can be seen, but rarely, most of the cases have been very, very uh, successful, specifically if they were started being treated on time. And the only thing that we need to make sure is that we should not use it in patients with herpes simplex um, uh, viral infections and uh, because it will aggravate that because it's going to be a stress to the cornea and that's one thing that will uh, wake up that virus basically. And sometimes it can be irritating to the cornea tissue and cause uh, swelling. Amniotic membranes very, very good additional thing into our basically era of treating lots and lots of cornea and eye issues, um, specifically with infections these days. Um, amniotic membranes are human, are from human. They're from placenta donated from moms who had C-section. Basically, they go to the eye bank and uh, they process, make sure that there are, you know, uh, no infections or no contraindication to be uh, applied on others' eyes. It's an in-office application, so it's no OR setting. We don't need to take patients to the operating room. There's no more stitches used with these uh, sort of tissues anymore. And uh, there have been a lot of promising clinical outcomes. Uh, again, we have them available in the office, and there are different um, uh, versions of those. Uh, they can treat a variety of eye surface diseases pretty fast and efficiently. Amniotic membrane, again, um, I told you, it's donated from the placenta of moms who had elective uh, C-section. And again, donors are all screened for any kind of diseases and uh, membrane is further treated with antibiotics and all antimicrobial agents just to make sure it's free of any infect infections. And it is made up of several types of collagen, uh, which is the same collagen that it's in cornea tissue and conjunctiva also. The benefits are, again, they act as a shield to protect conjunctiva and cornea as they heal. They also make patients pretty comfortable and they reduce the pain that is caused by friction of the eyelids over the eye surface and which cause a lot of erosions, abrasions, and uh, a lot of discomforts. Um, they also, it also promotes epithelial growth or the surface growth of the cornea, okay, and a better adhesion to the rest of the cornea tissue, and uh, also inhibits further cell uh, damage and death. Um, the deeper layers also can help, um, which they have, they contain all those fetal kind of like hyaluronic acid, reducing scarring and inflammation. Uh, they also uh, prevent any formation of bad vessels and they have antimicrobial properties. It's um, pretty well tolerated uh, from patients and there is nothing that could cause any rejection. So there are two versions, the main versions, there's uh, cryopreserved and the dehydrated. So the cryopreserved is a fresh tissue, but it is processed in a way that a lot of anti-inflammatory uh, effects of it, it's pretty uh, retained. Uh, so it actually cause uh, uh, anti-inflammatory -inf effects and promotes healing process. Uh, the tissue should be stored in freezer, however. We do have freezers in the office that we can uh, kind of like keep it in the office. It is held by a little ring, basically. So there's no stitch involved. It's just like placed in on the surface like a contact lens. And, uh, and it is FDA approved. The dehydrated version, it's dried. It's just like a disc shape. It's going to be placed on the eye and it's being held on the surface with the help of a bandage contact lens. Again, it does have a lot of um, uh, kind of like healing factors and anti-scarring factors, but it does not need to be um, 
kind of a kept in refrigerator. Uh, and again, we talked about is a lot of times we can help patients with bacterial viral fungal infections, a lot of times with ulcerations, sometimes patients we, who have reluctant dry eye disease, the contact lens very overwear and also autoimmune conditions, they can help. When there is nerve damage to the co uh, cornea and patients get ulcers because of that, even in the absence of any bacteria or viruses, we can help the cornea to regenerate with the help of all the healing factors of amniotic membranes. And um, uh, we can also use in those patients who we have had uh, experience of difficulty with managing uh, them with uh, just traditional uh, treatments. Again, corneal ulcers, chemical burns also are the ones that non-infectious, but we can help build up the um, uh, surface again and uh, to avoid any scarring and to promote healing. Again, early intervention is very crucial because it facilitates rapid wound healing, avoids complications such as corneal melt and secondary infections, reduce scarring for, uh, formation, and Overall, they improve final vision outcomes. Um, and the beauty of them is that at the same time, we can use eye drops and other medications because they can penetrate through. Mm. Then the other thing is that um, patients generally tolerate them very well. And I have never had any patient complaining of those. Um, maybe like one patient who had just some difficulty with keeping the contact lens on, but just like a little bit irritated, but ended up pretty tolerating it well. And um, she had a very good uh, treatment results. Uh, it can cause temporary blurry vision because there's gonna be a film over the cornea. And there's my discomfort because of the ring with Procara, but not with the dry version. Um, they usually dissolve on their own over one week. And with the Procara, we have to remove the ring once the tissue is dissolved. Okay, so in general, they're pretty convenient, safe, and effective. They're FDA approved. They provide excellent outcomes and they have changed the treatment of a variety of ocular surface diseases from surgical interventions now to just medical intervention in the office setting. And they're associated with improved outcome compared to conventional therapy. So this is the dry version. You see it, it's just like a little tissue or disc. It goes on the cornea. You can see just how much it can cause a little bit of a blurriness because you're looking through a little bit of a film, but you can still see. And then this is kept in place by, by the help of a bandage contact lens. And I usually leave it on as long as patient can tolerate, um, not even only for the time that the tissue is gonna be dissolved, but also even longer because it's been shown that even microscopic particles of that can help promoting the healing process. Procara is a little, I'm sorry, larger, and it's held by this little ring. You can see the ring when it's placed on the eye and a little bit of a fogginess that you can see. Sometimes if patients are not comfortable with blinking over that ring, we can put just a little tape, keep the eyelid closed for a little while until patient gets taller, uh, basically used to it and uh, they can blink over pretty fine. And in a week or 10 days at the most, we take it out. And uh, I just wanted to show you this case. It was a 32-year-old woman, had medical history of diabetes and dry eyes and a lot of other things that could even worsen the dry eye condition, had been gone through a lot of treatments and her vision was really not good, 20 hundred and the right eye. And uh, I uh, put uh, Procara for her. And then just a week after that, she came, removed that, Cornea was completely clear and her vision was improved down to 20, 25. That's about like seven, eight lines. And this is how she came to me first. As you can see, this is pupil. This is cornea in front of pupil. And this is all the uh, irritation and irregularity of the cornea. She got the Procara placed and I still could see some of it. And then by one week after this, is, this one was removed, everything was pretty clear and nice. And this is another one had 
HSV or herpes simplex keratitis. That's another uh, condition that amniotic membranes have been really helpful in uh, reducing the amount of scarring that we see pretty commonly with these uh, herpetic infections. Um, we now have them available and look how this much scarring and uh, opacity on the cornea is cleared up after use of amniotic membrane. So that was a pretty drastic improvement in vision in this patient as well. So just to summarize everything, I just wanted to let you know, not every red eye means infection. So please remove contacts as soon as you feel discomfort. Proper contact lens and hygiene is crucial and do not sleep with your contact lenses. Seek attention and contact your ophthalmologist with any concerning signs as soon as possible. Early diagnosis and treatment will take you a long way and it prevents eye damage and vision loss. New advances in treating infections such as amniotic membranes have been amazing and we are here for you to take care of your eyes like our own, even throughout weekends. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, well, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rahani. It does look like we do have a couple of questions. Uh, and if anybody does have questions, go ahead and, like I said, feel free to use that little Q&A uh, box down below on your browser. Um, the first question we have is, uh, I receive injections for AMD. How long after the injection do I have to wait before I shower uh, or introduce eye drops? Well, for um, injections for AMD or macular degeneration, we used to give patients in uh, antibiotics. Nowadays, they don't. So usually a few hours after or a day after, you're okay to go ahead and take shower because they usually these days um, really sterilize the eye right before and after the injection. So usually the risk of infection is very low and showering should not really cause any uh, risk. Fantastic. Um, what and where is the Zeiss scan located in the eye exactly? Zeiss glands are right behind where the lash follicle comes out. And I can go back to one of my, let's see. Uh, um, I can show you in a second on the, okay, here, right around here. So these are my bohemian glands. Zeiss glands are a little bit in front of them or anterior to them, right around the um, lashes, basically. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Um <laughs> Uh, were the photos that you showed of different types of corneal abrasions an active case, or was that scarred corneas after the abrasion had healed? Okay, maybe I have to go to those ones. What they talk about, hold on, let's see. Um, cornea. So was that about this question, this one? I believe so, yes. No, this is the active, active abrasion going on. When this stains like that, there's an active uh, going on. So once it is healed, it's not gonna stain like this. So you see like a little bit of a greenish area around this side, just an irregularity of the surface when we have a scratch. And this is pretty uh, not healed yet. Once this patient is back in about a week or 10 days, this should completely be covered and no staining. So this is an active part. If this is the question, and again, this is an erosion that is ongoing, so still not treated. I mean, not healed, I should say. Um, does one AM work better than the other type? Depends, yes, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of what, uh, what we're treating, mm, that is pretty important to choose one versus the other. So for corneal erosions, like the, when the surface of the cornea is pretty weak and it doesn't attach to the rest of the cornea really strongly, uh, Procara will help a lot more because the way that it is uh, processed 
it still has retained a lot of healing factors as compared to the dry version. Dry version, I, I should not say it's, it's uh, less strong or less helpful, uh, but it's just like different. So we use it in less uh, extensive things. However, I used like it because I didn't have Procura at the time when I had a patient of mine who I tried everything for the cornea ulcer. She was a 90 something year old patient with this bad non-healing cornea ulcer. And I used the dry version, which I knew most likely, most likely wouldn't be helpful. And it actually helped and closed the um, ulcer. But the dehydrated ones or the dry ones are not really uh, best to choose for significant amount of infections. And again, that case was a lucky case or however it was, I didn't have any other thing to use at the time. But if I had Procura at the time, I would have chosen Procura over or recurrent erosions Procura. But those with significant dry eyes, amniotic membranes, the dry version are the best. Um, can anything be done for old existing corneal scars over the pupil that may have affected your vision? That's a very good question too. Yes, there are different things that we can do based on how thick and how extended the scar is. So if it is really extended or deep, we might not be able to do any laser treatment and we may need to go ahead straight to the complete cornea transplant. In some cases we'll have more superficial scar, we can do some laser to minimize the density of the scar and make it a little bit more faint. That's what we can do. So yes, there are a lot of procedures that we can do when we're out of our medical intervention uh, stuff. Um, what about eye drops such as uh, Simbrinza? How long should somebody wait after uh, following an injection? Injection for AMD? Correct. They can use it. They can use a few hours. I wouldn't put it right away specifically because most of them are already opened. So they're not basically new bottles that are open. If you are opening a new bottle, you can put it right away. But if it is an opened eye drop or bottle that you've been using, I would wait for a few hours. And also it's always the best thing to ask your retina specialist too, but this is what we have been doing for our patients. A few hours after that should be okay to use the Brenza drop. And it does look like we have a clarification when it goes to the question where the photos that were yeah, shown like in side. active case. Yeah, the yeah. six, it was a slide with uh, six different types. Yes, I'll go to them right now. This one. Okay. Yeah, which one? And what's the question again? I'm sorry. About yeah, so the line. question yeah, the question was, were the photo of all of these photos uh, of the corneal abrasions, uh, are they active cases or were they scarred corneas after the abrasion had healed? No, so these are, are active. these active cases or, yes. or after healing? They are all active ulcerations. So there are ongoing infection in each eye, okay? But the stages could be different. Sometimes they send me patients with this stage, which is a pretty advanced stage when the cornea is pretty thinned out and really scar tissue is gonna be happening. Sometimes they are sent uh, to me like in earlier stages like this one, or this is just, just a potential fungal infection. I just wanted to show different ways that the ulcerations can show themselves um, caused by different um, bacteria or viral, virus, viral agents or fungal um, infections. So these are really teeny tiny ones. Patients usually don't get any uh, visual problems with these because they're away from the pupil, but this is active infection going on. And if they're not treated, they can affect the vision as well. These are pretty important because it's already thinning there. And if you don't treat it on time, it's gonna really get thinner and melt and cause perforation. This is a one that will be treated, but it's still in active infection. It's usually mostly bacterial and can cause a lot of scarring. And can this one can practically become this if it's not treated on time or correctly. Okay, well, I hope like that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, and it looks like we just have one more question, and sure. that is, uh, we all we often see elderly patients with inverted eyelashes, and that can cause the irritation or redness, like you were saying. Um, what can be done for that, though? How can that be? How can that be fixed? Well, I usually remove them in the office. So as soon as I see some of them, so they can be plugged. I usually don't like to cauterize them. But this is one thing that we can do too. So we can cauterize them so they never grow back again. But a lot of times we don't need to do that because not necessarily if one time it can grow inward, it can regrow in the same direction. But if it is already there, basically rubbing against the eyeball or a cornea, then I will remove it right away. But I don't recommend you, you doing it yourself because you can pretty easily scratch your eye when you get pretty close to the eye. So we always take a look and we remove them. The, uh, the usual last cycle is about two months. So once we remove it completely, it takes about two months to regrow. And it takes about like a, another, another additional few months to grow back again to that length to cause um, abrasions if they grow the same way. So we watch those patients. If they regrew it that direction again, sometimes we remove them completely um, permanently with cauterization. And we have one more general email or question, and that is, will the video be emailed out after the record the recordings of the lecture? Uh, and we absolutely can email those out to you. Um, we, and we can absolutely do that and those will be sent out. So uh, it looks like we are all finished up with our questions. We wanna thank everybody obviously for, for joining us tonight and for you, Dr. Rahani, for a very informative lecture. We have multiple people thanking you uh, in the chat as we as we speak. Um, yeah, if, if anybody has any questions uh, after tonight's webinar, please do feel free to email us. You can email us uh, at marketing at harvardeye.com uh, and we'll be, we'll be more than happy to assist you or you can always reach us on, on our main telephone line and we can assist you that way as well. Um, we will be sending out after you end, uh, after we end this session, there will be a very, very brief uh, survey. If you don't mind taking that, that will be of great help to us. We'll greatly appreciate it. It's, it's just a couple of quick questions on, you know, how we can improve these going forward. And, and we really thank you for your time. So um, yeah, on behalf of, of Dr. Ahani, myself and, and everybody at Harvard I, we, we appreciate you guys being on with us tonight. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in the future and have everybody have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good evening. Yeah, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.